Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Blog Chat with National Parks Tonight. I'm Matt Hill and I'm Chris Nicholson. Welcome. We're going to give everybody a moment to get into the room and get situated because, you know, technology and stuff. So I, I'm just... alone, man. I'm quarantined. <laughs> well, I'm talking about the virtual room, Chris. Oh, the virtual room. The okay. virtual room. Yeah. Um, tonight is a very special Friday. You know why? There's two amazing things that we have. We have Chris and we have the topic of creativity. So you put those two together and you have Friday. <laughs> creativity Friday. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so um, I, I'm really excited. This, this, when I read this post, when it came out, I was, I, I was, I was stoked. I went out and immediately tried some of the things. Uh, so I did. Well, I hope you try them all year. That's the point. Like, uh, you know, you gotta put in time on this stuff. Yeah, no, no, I stopped immediately. Why would <laughs> oh, I? Oh, okay. All right. Oh, you're <laughs> a pro. You know, you just you just got it. Yeah. I'm a pro at starting and stopping things. Yeah. Oh, like okay. My shutter. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are. That was kind of the point of this post is um, you're never as good as you can be as an artist, right? I mean, if you ever hit a point where you're just like, oh, man, I, I got this now, then you're fooling yourself. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you can always be better. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the challenges of being some kind of an artist or being a photographer is, yeah, I know for me, and this seems to be the case with all the photographers I know, is it's kind of rare to level up, to really level up your work. Uh, I'm like, I'll just, I'll go years without feeling like I really got any better. You know, where the, you know, consistency is good, but, you know, I'll look back because I haven't done anything really different in a while. Um, you know, and I, I can think back to specific times in my career. So I've been shooting like about 25 years now, and I can, I can think of times when I did get better when I, you know, I had a jump, but mostly it's a plateau creatively, right? Like mostly we're just kind of going along like this, and then all of a sudden there's a jump. All of a sudden our work is better. Yeah. And it's an exciting thing. And if you think back to it, you can usually tie it to something. Like in my 20s, I remember I, I went through this thing where I started deliberately breaking rules, you know, because I just kind of got, well, this was my tennis photography stuff. And I, I kind of got bored with shooting the same stuff over and over. And whenever I caught myself saying, oh, this is how I'm supposed to do it. If I could catch myself doing that, I would break the rule. I said, no, 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 let me break the rule and see what I can make of it, right? So I remember that was a creative jump for me. And then uh, another creative jump is when I started spending a lot of time shooting national parks, like I in my 20s and my first half of my 30s, like my park shoots would be kind of short. And then as I got older, I would do these long, I would spend like a week and a half in a park and like hyper-focusing, like really delving deeply into a subject uh, that boosted my cre creativity. All of a sudden my work was better. And then another time was when I started doing night photography more consistently. Uh, you know, it's something I'd been interested in for a long time, but when I got serious about doing that a lot, all of a sudden my creativity across all my work jumped. So, you know, if you think about times in your creative life that you've had these jumps where, you know, you went uphill from a plateau, I think most of the time you can probably, looking back on it, tie it to something. So the idea of this blog post about six ways to level up your night photography, and it's really six ways to level up your photography or six ways to level up your creativity in general. This works for anything that you're doing. But the idea was, what if we can make this happen deliberately? So instead of looking back on some catalyst and you know, you know, finding some catalyst from our past and connecting it to creative growth, what if we had ways that we could force this to happen? You know, we could give ourselves challenges uh, that if we meet them could boost our creativity. And that's where the idea for this blog post came. Oh, so, so excited. Should yeah. we dig right in? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. We should dig in first, but I gotta say something. What's that? I gotta give a shout out to my daughter, Maggie, because she's home right now and she's sick and uh, mm -hmm. she's watching me and so, Hi, sweetie. I hope you're feeling better, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the, the live stream. Okay. We, we all miss you. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so let's let's jump into this. All right, here we go. So 
first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoomify. There we go. Zoomify. That's our new word. Zoomify. You can only zoomify text. That's it. Nothing oh, else. Okay. Yeah. Zoomifying yeah. text. Got it. Yep. yep. All right. So, um, yeah. So what I did is I broke this down into six different things. And now, of course, you can, there's a lot more than six, you know, any challenge you can come up with for yourself is, is great. Um, but I, I thought of these six things um, as things that maybe I've done in the past or that I want to do in the future. And I tried to give an example for when this kind of thing worked for me. Uh, and the, the first one was learning a new technique. Uh, we, you know, I kind of think of photography techniques as tools and you can always learn new, new techniques and you have new tools to put in your toolbox so that when you're out in the field uh, and a situation arises, uh, you know, you've trained yourself now to recognize, that, oh, this is an opportunity to use this tool, right? Um, it's, uh, it's sort of a proactive and a re reactive approach in one. Uh, so it's a good idea to always be developing new tools, learn new techniques. Um, and, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I realized that, um, I think it was actually, I realized because my brother mentioned it to me, that all the light painting I, doing, I was doing was with warm light. Um, I was always um, juxtaposing the cool tones of a night scene, particularly under moonlight, with warm light painting, because I like that I like that, uh, you know, that contrast of color temperatures, but I kind of got into a rut with it. And my brother mentioned it. And um, I was like, hey, really, you know, I, I'm gonna, as a creative challenge, and I spent all of 2018 doing this, is when I did light painting, I, I would make an effort, not for every shot, but as often as I could think of it when it worked to use light that uh, kind of blended with the scene so that maybe it looked like natural, natural light. Maybe it looked like light that was coming from the moon or trying to match the color temperature of a street light nearby. Uh, so instead of creating a juxtaposition of color temperatures, I was, um, or just making everything look like it was natural. Now I like both ways. Uh, there's not a right and a wrong way to do it. But the point was that I'd gotten to a rut of doing one thing. So I really focused on doing the other just to help boost my creativity. Uh, can I jump in for a sec? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I think I did something similar back in 2018 when I I acknowledged the fact that I love black and white so much that it was almost an exclusive practice for me. Uh -huh. um, and that's when when we got a hold of the that that particular LED panel we love, the Lux Violas, that I could be as specific with color temperatures I wanted to be. And I got away from using chroma color but being very peculiar in particular about color temperature. And I said, that's the year I'm gonna master color. Like you're talking about being very deliberate about being warm or cool or neutral. Yeah. Um, and that was a good year. That was a really yeah. good year of leveling up and understanding and being very choosy about what I was doing every time I set up. So I, I, I completely understand what you, what you did. I love yeah, it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, and, and it's a good example of a different way you can do this. Like there's all sorts of, new techniques you could learn um you know and the, the thing that i'm doing this year is trying to really master hyperfocal distance um it's something that you know i've understood it for a long time I, I understand it well enough to teach it but i've never gotten it down so much that i can just do it in the back of my head you know like I, I always shoot manual exposure and I can, I can switch between exposures without even thinking about it. I can change aperture and the shutter speed and the ISO. It's not a conscious process, you know, because it's, it's just, um, it's just all ingrained in my memory. I'm not that way with hyperfocal distance. When, you know, you know, when I, when I see a situation where I really need to use hyperfocal and it's gotta be a time when I really need it, because I'm not as good at it. So I'm likely, I'm more likely to use other methods of focusing at night. But when I am going to use it, I've got to really stop and think, and I've got to like get out the calculator. Um, I've got to, you know, pace things out it, it, and it slows me down creatively. Right. Like that's not how I want to be. I want to, I want to be able to use hyperfocal distance just as fluidly as I can change my exposure manually. So that's my goal this year, right? Because getting rid of that 
and sort of that thought obstacle is going to help me creatively. I'm going to I'm going to be able to shoot photos more easily that I can't shoot easily now. I'm going to cut back on my my um, you know my conscious thought process in the field on technical stuff, which will allow me to focus more on just the creative aspect. Uh, so that that's my goal intended? in 2020. Sorry. Was that pun intended? No, which one? What was it? <laughs> you said you were going to focus on it. I'm going to focus, yeah. That should have been intended. <laughs> I'm going to hyper-focus on learning hyper-focus. There it is. Yeah. There yeah, so is. by the end of 2020, my goal was that I could just do it. Um, I, it just happens automatically for me. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's, that's beautiful. You, um, you, you mentioned, you know, like, uh, well, actually, you showed you showed a really uh, beautiful image here. Let's let's jump back into the post for a second. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm 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 so anxious to get to the, the picture. I just want to make sure that we lead up to it the right way. Is this I love the, bad, the picture. The, the Badlands photo. It is. I'm teasing it right now. Oh, oh everybody okay. saw it on the on the promo. Yeah. What's the What's the story with with the Badlands picture? Well, you were there. Uh, I mean, you were right there with me shooting this. I don't know. Yeah. If, I don't know if you remember this night, but you were you were maybe a hundred yards off working on your thing, and uh, I was, you know, I was shooting this. Uh, the funny thing about this image, so Matt, you know the story. I've never told anybody else the story. Is I kind of mistimed when the moon was coming up. Uh, I thought I had longer, so I started this long exposure, and then the moon's coming. I'm like, oh no! I hope it doesn't come over that peak and blow everything out before uh, it's too late. I ended up, it, and it, if this exposure was open another two minutes, the whole thing would have gotten ruined. Um, but anyway, the what I did with this is uh, another uh, sort of a habit I fell into um, when doing long exposures was not doing long exposures. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you and I were talking the other night about stack, you know, star stacking to create star trails. And there are, are times when star stacking is the only solution that's going to work for creating star trails. But there's also times when you don't need to do that, where you can capture everything in one exposure. Uh, I had gotten into the habit of always star stacking. It, it didn't matter what the conditions were. I mean, it could have been a perfectly dark sky and I was star stacking anyway. Um, and I, a part of the reason was because a lot of times when I'm out shooting, I'm kind of in a rush, right? Like I might be on a trip doing prep work for a workshop for the following year. And I've got two nights to nail a dozen photos and I'm just trying to work fast. Um, or maybe a, maybe we're on a workshop and I, and I have a few minutes to do a photo and I, I don't have an hour to dedicate to it because, you know, I'm trying to work with the attendees. So I set up and just do a star stack or whatever. I got in the habit of it. Uh, so one of the things I was doing last year was making a point to do the longer exposure and to get the stars and the light painting, everything in one shot. Um, I'm not a purist who says you always have to do everything in camera in one photo. But for me last year, it was an exercise to do that. And uh, this photo is, is, is the case. So uh, this photo, it would have been really easy to star stack it. In fact, if I had star stacked it, I wouldn't have been worried about the moon so much because as soon as the moon came up and blew out the scene, I could have just stopped my stack and used just the photos from before then. Uh, but again, this was something I was doing all last year is whenever I wanted to do star trails, I was trying to do it in one exposure, uh, it, you know, again, just for that creative benefit of um, sort of swinging my habits back to the middle, right? Yep. Uh, so in this case, it was a 10 minute exposure. Um, you know, two years ago, I, I probably would have shot, you know, 10 one minute exposures for this out of habit. Last year, I did the full 10 minutes and added the light painting into it to get it all in one shot. I love it. I love it. I, I, I gosh, I remember I, I used to be a purist. I used to say, I got it all in camera. But that now that I guess we've, we've worked through teaching so many techniques to so many people that I've adopted an attitude of um, there's a tool for every situation and sometimes multiple responses to every situation. Right. And they're all equally great as long as you get the result that you intended. Yeah, it's the final image that matters. And um, something I think about a lot is WWAD. What would Ansel do? 
right? <laughs> I think it's funny because a lot of purists would be like, well, you know, the old masters wouldn't have done that. Yes, they would have, you know, so much, you know, people forget about the dark room, right? And how much magic was created in the dark room, right? You know, uh, capture has always been only half of the creative process. Yeah. So I don't have any problem using post-production techniques to, to finish off an image. I mean, that's the way it's always been. Uh, I think as an industry, we kind of got stuck in the capture everything in camera mindset during the slide film era because you had to, you know, right. um, I think it's a bad habit. I, I think the final image is, is what matters. And uh, as long as you're creating the photo that, that you want to create, you're creating the art that you want to create. That's the most important thing. Right, and the, the real answer to what would Ansel do is push the boundaries of the craft with whatever available technology there is. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 And that's a whole other blog post that I've been yeah. thinking about is, yeah. is, you know, the, the, this whole idea that we're talking about, um, you know, the best photographers were never ones who limited themselves to the technology of 50 years ago. They were the photographers who pushed the envelope of what's accessible to us now. Yep. Right. Totes. So anyway, that's tangent. Heck. <laughs> hey, wait, tangents are us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that a, is that does anybody have that domain? Tangents are us.com? Probably. Right. <laughs> uh so another thing to do is is try a new camera. Um you know, it's uh, we always talk about how you should know your camera so well that you could use it in the dark, right? And for us, that's literal because we do use our cameras in the dark. Um, and that's great. You absolutely should. But learning a new camera can kind of push you back into a deliberate decision making process that can change the way that you think creatively. Um, I wish I could remember exactly what it was. There's uh, this, this story about a concert pianist who years back was forced to play on a bad piano and he was furious about it. And he was going to walk out. Somebody famous and somebody listening probably knows actually we have a composer who comes on a lot of workshops. He probably knows exactly who I'm talking about. Uh, but the, the story was that this guy was actually going to walk out and he was convinced that he coming out and doing it. It ended up being one of the, the hallmark performances of, of this career uh, because uh, you know, studies have shown, psychology studies have shown that being under pressure or being taken out of your routine actually increases creativity. It actually can improve your performance. So for me, trying to learn a new camera while you're actually out shooting can have that same effect. Now, it's probably not something I would want to do on a really important shoot. You know, if I was being paid to be out and shoot something, I, I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure that I'm producing the best work I can. But if you've got the luxury of being out shooting for fun, just shooting for enjoyment, just shooting to uh, become a better photographer, this is another thing you can do is, is find a new camera, whether you're, you're buying it or borrowing it or renting it and, uh, and learn how to use it, you know. Uh, the photo I have in the blog post here was an example from last year. Uh, you and Lance were doing the workshop in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I live only a couple hours away, so I came to visit for a couple of nights, and uh, we had just gotten our hands on the, the Nikon Z6. So I used it for a couple of nights, and it was driving me absolutely bonkers, like not to be able to use the viewfinder for a night photo and <laughs> and, and it just like everything that was different about it was it, it just seems like every limitation it had was right in the wheelhouse of how I work so like I couldn't do things like shining my flashlight through the viewfinder because it's not a real viewfinder uh, but that as much as it was driving me nuts the, the benefit I had is that it really forced me to slow down and think about some of the things that I was doing um, and like right what? here that I well, like composing without being able to see through the viewfinder, um, ah, you know, uh, yeah. composing without being able to shine the flashlight through the viewfinder. It, it's a great trick that Lance taught me. You shine the flashlight through the viewfinder and it'll light up the scene in front of you. Everything that the lens contains is going to be contained in that light that you see. I couldn't do that with the mirrorless. So I, I had to revert into other ways of composing in the dark, like just taking a photo and seeing what comes out in the LCD right. and then adjusting from there. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, because of that, it, it, again, it just, it put me in sort of this creative stressful situation 
that really did boost the way I was thinking. Um, I think out, out of the three of us that tried to make that, that shot that evening, uh, I like yours the best. Yeah. Oh, yeah. thanks. That, mean, that means a lot because you were yeah. right there making it too. That was right um, after I dropped my camera for the first time in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you were the one who saw the scene, right? Or was it Lance? No, I think it was Lance. Oh, it was yeah. Lance? Okay, yeah, because yeah. we were shooting something on the other side of the road, all three of us. Yeah. And um, Lance had walked onto the other side of the bridge yeah. and saw that the moon just, I mean, filled up this this stream and the, it was beautiful. And then like that, all three of us were over there shooting it. Yeah. So, well, thanks. It's kind of you to say. Oh, it's truth. Uh, um, along the same lines, try a new lens. Um, Gabe wrote a great blog post a couple of years ago about, um, you know, he had this idea where, like you could go into Lightroom and select, you know, like your year's worth of photos and then look at the metadata to see which lens you use the most, right? And, um, you know, he, he drew his own conclusions from that, which are separate than what I'm talking about. But you know, my point is that everybody really does have a lens they use the most. And if you go in into Lightroom's metadata, you can find that out pretty easily. Uh, and that's great because, you know, we want to develop a style. We want to develop a, a look, a recognizable look to our photos. You know, that's probably every artist's career long goal. Uh, you know, but on the flip side, by forcing yourself, by using a, a different lens than maybe you're comfortable with or a different lens that, than you're used to, you force yourself to see in a new way. Uh, in fact, this is sometimes something I'll do deliberately to shake up my the way I'm seeing things in the field. Like if, if I'm out shooting and I feel like I'm in a rut, that's a trick I use sometimes. You don't be change lenses, uh, you know, just to force me to see differently. Uh, and this is especially effective if, if it's a lens you've never used before. And the shining example for me is the Nikon fisheye zoom. Uh, we have one of these... Um, I wish I had it to show right here. It's in the other room. Uh, we have one of these in our, our the kit that we bring to uh, to workshops. Uh, Nikon uh, provides a kit of gear that we bring to every workshop for people to use. And the fisheye zoom is in there. And it's uh, it, it's interesting to see people use this lens because uh, it's hard to get off the camera. <laughs> you know, it's like, not, it, it forces you to see differently, but then it looks really cool. And you start doing these creative things that get addictive. Um, and uh, it's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like there's no, I mean, there's no other lens. There's no lens in my kit that I own that I could do this photo with. So when I put this lens on the camera, I'm immediately seeing everything in terms of circles. Um, I'm saying, oh, that would make a great circle photo and this would make a great circle photo. In fact, when we were doing our Outer Banks workshop last year, I had an idea of doing star circles in that circle format. I was like, oh, this is gonna be so awesome. And I set up at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse and I got the North Star right behind the lighthouse and the cameras down on the ground pointing almost straight up the circle and I let it rip for an hour and a half and it came out really cool, except I blew the focus. <laughs> uh, but my, my point is that if it had been in focus, that's the photo you would have just shown. That's the photo I would have used in the blog post because it, it, again, it just got me to think differently. I'm like a circle format, but I could do star circles and just seeing things in a new way. Yeah, I, I use, um, I, I, I commonly bring my 7200 with me, which is not really considered a night photography lens, but I like to do details uh -huh. when people are going wide. Not just to be contrary, but sometimes I just want I star trails to happen faster, silhouettes, something like that. Um, but the weird, the weirdest lens I bring with me on a regular basis is the Petzval 85 millimeter lens, which is the softest, sharp portrait lens you'll ever see. And and the out of focus stars with the crazy bokeh on that lens, it's great for night portraiture. And probably, mm -hmm. and, and I've taken pictures of monuments, not portraits of people with it. And the center is sharp, but nothing else. And it just gets smudgier the further out you go. And if you do star trails with the star trails look really freaking weird. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is, just, this, is this the lens that you were uh, you were shooting me a lot with in Olympic? Maybe. Okay, maybe I remember you had the, just gotten a lens that you were you kept doing portraits of me with it because you were excited I think so, about it. I think so. Yeah, I did yeah. shoot one of the C stacks with this, and I did take a picture of you with it. It's that brass lens. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yep. the one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. The the Irix eleven is also another phenomenal oh, yeah. example, right? Yeah, yeah, and that and that kind of combines with the the last point too um, about you know um, challenging yourself. The Irix, it's an amazing lens, and it's so wide that you really have to get creative to use it well. Um, you know, you can get it really super close to your subject and open up the background, and um, but yeah, that's another good example. Oh wow. All right. Well, like, let's let's move on to point number four. Yeah, go outside your box, right? And uh, this, you know, this is similar to what we've been talking about already, right? Like a lot of these things are about stretching your creativity, but this one's a little different because the, here I'm talking about anything that's outside the realm of what you'd normally do. Uh, and for me, the the biggest example for me in the last few years has been shooting man-made things. Uh, uh, before, before National Parks at Night, I was all nature. Well, tennis, you know, do my tennis work too. But my, my nature work, if there was something man-made in it, I was moving on. You know, I didn't want a person in it. I didn't want a building in it and nothing. And then I started shooting with Lance a lot. Oh, Lance a lot. That's funny. Lance a lot. Yeah, Lance a lot. Um, so I started shooting with Lance a lot. Uh, and he, he's, I don't want to say completely the opposite, but Lance, uh, likes, he really likes, uh, juxtaposing the man-made and the natural worlds. Uh, and because I was shooting with him, I would end up in situations where I was shooting things I wasn't, I wouldn't normally shoot. Uh, and that was good for me creatively. Um, even if I wasn't ever going to use those photos, it, it's still good to shoot something that's different from what you usually do uh, because it can, again, it can just make you start to think differently uh, and you can bring those creative breakthroughs back to your normal genre. Uh, and the example, the photo in this blog post is from uh, Borrego Springs, California. Uh, we did, uh, we've done several workshops there with Atlas Obscura. And it's a really wild place with these uh, desert sculptures. There's like a hundred and something sculptures out in the desert and uh, there's dinosaurs and rhinoceros and horses and, and all these crazy things. I had, I have zero interest in shooting this stuff. Uh, and I went and taught two of the workshops with Lance only because none of the rest of you were available to do it. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, fine, I'll go shoot it. And I did a similar thing with Gabe a couple of years ago when he was running the workshop at Sloss Furnaces in Birmingham, uh, where none of you guys were available to do it. And I was like, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go do it, you know? And I had a blast at both of these locations because it, ex it hit this point dead on about how shooting something outside of your norm can really boost your creativity. Um, you know, I was in Borrego Springs and I just could not get enough of shooting the stuff at night. And it's, it's not something that's going to end up in, you know, the second edition of my photographing National Parks book. It's probably not something that's going to end up in my career ending portfolio or whatever, um, because it's not, it's not in the wheelhouse of what I, you know, kind of what I, what I associate my work with, you know. Uh, but it's a blast to shoot, and it did help me creatively. Uh, and I look forward to hopefully being able to get back to either one of those places again. I look forward to, to trying to get out to Borrego one of these days. I, you guys have had so much fun there. Yeah. And I look at those images and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> give me more. Yeah. There's so much to work with. It's, it's, it's just a lot of fun. Speaking, speaking of traveling to a new location. Yep. Yep. That's another one. Right. Um, I like, you know, I do the, I do the lectures on photographing the national parks and one of the, questions I get a lot is, you know, how many parks you've been to. Uh, people just assume that I'm out there trying to shoot everything. And I'm not. Uh, I actually like to go back to the same places. Like I've been to Acadia 12 or 15 times in Death Valley, 10 times in Yellowstone, like five times in Olympic. And I like going back to the same places because I like getting to shoot them in different light and a different weather and different times of year and all that. And I do believe in that. 
Um, but there's a lot that can come from shooting in a new place uh, because you're seeing, you're just seeing new stuff. You know, you're seeing things you haven't seen before. Uh, and, and anybody, whether you're a photographer or not, can appreciate this from this perspective. Like, think of wherever you grew up, you know, especially if it's someplace you lived for a long time and think of some major tourist attraction near you that I would bet most of you never went to. I, I grew up in Southern Connecticut, an hour outside of New York City, and I was 16 before I saw the Statue of Liberty. You know, whereas somebody visiting New York, that's probably one of the first things they're gonna go see. Why? Because when we're traveling, we're excited to see new stuff, yeah. right? So as a creative person, when you're traveling, that excitement can manifest itself in uh, new ways of being creative. Um, so, you know, the example I used here in, in the blog post was when you and I were in Devil's Tower last year. Uh, I mean, it was, it was just such a cool place. It started, it, it's, it, it was so exciting to be in a new place that was very photogenic and very spiritual that it was actually triggering different creative um, impulses in me. I, I had never really shot a lot of panos. And all of a sudden that week, it was pano, 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 uh, because it was such a great location for it. So just being in a place that lent itself well to a particular technique kicked that creativity into me, where now all of a sudden I'm, I'm just driving and driving at something I hadn't done before. This pano is stunning. I just noticed that the clouds uh, make the image. Oh, yeah. You, you were cloud whispering that night, weren't you? <laughs> I was cloud whispering, yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I kind of liked um I kind of liked how the the wispy clouds were sort of mirrored by the the wispiness of the grass and the meadow and um to me that balanced out um but yeah, anything out there like kind of putting the tower in it and then finding other things in the landscape to balance out a pano like the Milky Way here right uh in that tree off to the left and uh and all. i just couldn't get enough of that week I, uh, enough of that that week i was shooting panos like you know five times a night uh, uh. so yeah. so this is the, we're talking about new locations and you want to reshoot old locations too don't you yeah that you know <laughs> both of these right so there, there's all different tools right and it yeah. it's not you know it's not a case of you know, you might think, well, you just said I should shoot a new one. Not you're saying I should shoot an old one. But yeah, because they both work. Yeah. Um, you know, I said before, I, I like going back to Acadia and, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that happens when you go back, and in this case, the, the example was the, the uh, Highland Lighthouse in Cape Cod National Seashore. I think I first shot that when I was 23. And I'm 48 now. So that's tw what, 25 years ago. The first well, time I, I shot this lighthouse. Wow. And... I don't, I can't even tell you how many times I've been back there. And it's really to the point where when I go back, I'm like, <sighs> okay, <laughs> you know, it's a great lighthouse to shoot because you have a lot of access. Like you've got almost 360 degrees of access and you can back up and you can move in and there's a fence around the front. There's this white picket fence and in the back, there's a, a wood railing fence and you can, go to a spot where there's a path that leads to it. I mean, there's all these different creative possibilities and I just feel like I've shot them all. Um, and now we've, we've led a couple of night photography workshops there in the past couple of years. And of course, we're going to bring the group here, right? It doesn't matter, you know, we're on a workshop. It doesn't matter if, if I'm tired of shooting the location or not, it's a great spot. So we bring the group and even then I'm like, oh, I got to shoot this thing again. But the, you know, if you walk into that situation and face it, instead of saying, no, I'm not going to shoot there again, I'm tired of it, walk in and face that and say, I'm tired of it. I feel like I've shot everything I can here, but I'm still going to find a new way to do it. Right. right. Give yourself that challenge. And in this case, I, mean, I was just blessed with this. I mean, this amazing light that came in. I mean, the clouds were in and uh, they're, they're kind of being, they're going to be lit by uh, Provincetown back in the distance and juxtaposing that with the cool lights uh, in the lighthouse itself and you know coming from the house and the tower and all that everything came together in a way I hadn't seen before 
and I had no intention of shooting this night at, I got the camera and, and I'm shooting. Um, is again, if you just keep your eyes open, you will find a way to shoot something new. It's gorgeous. Thanks. It's gorgeous. Look at I just the, the delicacy of, the, of the spare places that you decided to place the light. Yeah. And that was a group effort. Actually, it was, um, we were shooting, uh, Lance was there and there were four of the participants. This was the last night of the workshop. Uh, we kind of let people split between two lighthouses and this was the group that was at Highland Light. And uh, that was a group effort of uh, adding that light. There's a little bit of light in the foreground, a little bit on the house to the right, and then the house, uh, sorry, the light that's on the tower coming from the left, um, all with Luxley's, if I remember correctly. Amazing. Were, were they watching TV inside the house or did you guys light the inside of the house too? Okay, so that's funny. Uh, no, there's nothing going on inside the house except uh, there's like a computer monitor on on the lower floor and that's what's lighting the two windows uh, on the bottom. The window up on the top was dark because there was nothing in that room up there, but I didn't like the balance. So I copied the light from the windows on the bottom and put it up on the top. Ah, I found one of your tricks. <laughs> I found one of your tricks. That's, yeah. I never would have. You never would have. <laughs> I never would have. Well never, done, sir. Never would have done it or never would have guessed it? Guessed. Oh, okay. So it's it's really well done. I said it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I think I copied the top of one window and the bottom of the other so it wouldn't look exactly the same. I don't, so, I don't remember. So clever. So, thanks. <laughs> so, so you, 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 I think you said that you have some other images that you wanted to share. Well, I've got, um, you know, I thought if we had time, I, I could, let me, let me see. Nobody uh, told us to stop yet. <laughs> Does anybody want us to stop? I don't hear any complaints. So, I mean, this is when I put together this blog post. Uh, so I had this idea of, you know, okay, what are some times that I, um, that I've done these things, right? Cause I needed, I needed something to illustrate what I was talking about. And so I went through my photos from the last few years and I pulled about 40 photos that were good examples of the things I was talking about. And then I, I could only pick like six of them for the blog post. So I thought if we had a few extra minutes, I could just show some of the other ones. Uh, this is, uh, is my screen share working? It's good. Yes, absolutely. All right, so you can see the photo from Biscayne right now, right? Yes, I can. Um, so this is in Biscayne National Park. Uh, this is another workshop that I, I wasn't teaching on. Uh, Tim and Gabe were doing this in 2018. You crash a lot of workshops, don't you? Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was speaking in uh, Florida the same week. So I just drove over, drove over to the other coast and met them up because they had the boat. Um, if you don't know anything about Biscayne, it's a really wild park. I, only 10% of it is land. So you need a boat to get to most of it. And Tim and Gabe had arranged for a boat. And I'm like, well, I'm going to take advantage of this, right? Uh, so this is out on, um, is this the one on Elliott Key? Um, no, I think this is a different. Anyway, it's on one of the islands that we went to. And this was not something I ever would have shot before. Um, but I, I kind of... I, I wanted to get, get away from the group um, because I wanted them to kind of have their space to themselves. You know, I was, I was there shooting, not teaching, but I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be taking up their space either. So I sort of went off to another part of the island and, and found this and I saw the pier and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And, I, and then I just got the idea to light paint it. Uh, again, this is not something I ever would have shot before. I, normally I would have stuck to the trees and the beach, but there was a lot of wind that night. So the trees were going all over and uh, I shot this instead. And I, it, because it was something that was out of, out of the box for me, I sort of developed the concept as I went along. So I started by light painting the posts and then I had the idea to light, to light the lights up in the top. And then my final idea was to shine the light on the ground to create uh, you know, the spots. Uh, so like if you saw my original base photo, those lights don't actually work. This is all light painting. Uh, and it completely outside the realm of, of anything I'd done before and really anything I've done since, but it felt good. You know, it felt really good to be able to create what I thought was a successful image in a place that I'd never would have shot before. I would call this a believable fiction. A believable fiction. <laughs> okay. I like it. It just, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, I think I see some comments to say it looks like a painting. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah, you kind of get this uh, weird effect in the background. Uh, this is, I think it's Miami, or it's at least the suburbs of Miami off on the distance. You get like this light and the dark and the light and the dark, which I think kind of creates a painterly effect on the horizon. Um, cool. But uh, but I have done a little bit of this since, like just the whole idea of lighting the lights. Like I've, I've adapted that into other photos I've done since. Um, and even using the light to you know, create those circles. Like I've, I've done that a little bit too. In fact, Matt, I, I, the, we sh you and I shot a barn in um, Theodore Roosevelt National Park last year. And I used this exact same thing. Now that scene, uh, the, the barn and, and the national park, that's a little more in my wheelhouse of the kind of thing I usually shoot. And I probably wouldn't have shot it that way if I didn't do this the year before. So this was a creative breakthrough in a sense. Uh, that even though this isn't a photo that's in my wheelhouse, I used the techniques that I sort of pieced together for this photo when I did shoot something that was in my wheelhouse. And that's the kind of connection I'm talking about. I love it. I, I've been saying for a while that um, everything we do informs everything else we do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah. We, borrow, uh, we borrow from our own stories, so to speak, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just scrolling through here just to see if there's anything else that stands out to me. This is in Sloss Furnaces. Uh, I did this on one of the prep nights with Gabe. Um, and this is a similar thing. I, I lit that, that um, the lamp up. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to Biscayne. I, you know, I hadn't done that before. And, and now that's a concept that uh, has stuck with me, right? So that's a tool in my toolbox now that when I see a lamp, maybe I'll go and light it like that. Um, this is, again, this is up in Borrego. Um, and uh, again, the kind of thing, and this almost meshes the kind of thing I would normally shoot with what I wouldn't, right? Like I love to shoot wildlife in a national park. And here, because they're sculptures, they were standing still for me. And I had all the time I needed. Uh, same kind of thing. Again, these are in Borrego. Uh, here's another example with the, uh, the, the Nikon 8 to 15, the fisheye zoom, uh, which again allowed me to see this scene in a completely different way. Um, oh, here's the one from um, there it uh, is. Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. So that light was not lit. There was no light on the front of the building. I, I added all of that. And uh, again, it, that went back to the photo I did in Biscayne the year before uh, when that technique really clicked for me. Um, this was an example of just embracing the, uh, the circumstances. This was that I was with Lance and our group in um, Scotland a couple years ago at the Hebrides. And the, the atmospheric conditions were such that just could not keep dew off the lens. I mean, the <laughs> lens just kept fogging up. So I, if you can't beat them, join them. I embraced it and shot soft focus. Nice. And now, wait, riddle me this. Go back. Yeah. Do you know if those are Dolman or Kromlich? I don't know. If okay. Lance is online, he can answer the question. <laughs> uh, Sloss Furnaces, again, Sloss Furnaces. And um, uh, wow. Yeah, this is up, actually up in Big wow. Ben. This was the last night of our workshop last year. And I was, I was tired and didn't really want to shoot anymore. Um, but there were a couple of people still left and they wanted to go to another location. And um, I, uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll do it. And I didn't shoot for a while. And then I, I saw this, I was like, it just clicked. So this is an example of pushing yourself when you're not comfortable, right? Um, where I, I, I kind of gave myself some time to sort of ease into the scene and shoot in circumstances I wouldn't normally want to be shooting. And it was like after midnight, I'm tired and, and all this. Uh, but I saw something and, and went and did it. Um, this was in, uh, this is the first time I was in Iceland. This was my first night shoot ever in Iceland and it was freezing and jet lagged and tired, but it was also the first time I'd ever seen Aurora like this. Uh, it was really kind of intense and filling the sky. Uh, and all of that just kind of added, added together to get me in a creative mood to shoot something that was uh, a little different than things I'd shot before. Um, sure. Wow. Yeah, so these are all just examples of, of times that I've that I've done uh, the sorts of things we we're talking about in the blog post. So you've committed to using 2020 to grow using your own goals that you've outlined in this post, right? Uh, well, I, I try to do this every year. I try to pick 
something uh, to change. And I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a big sports fan. I'm a, a big Yankees fan. This comes from something I heard Derek Jeter used to do. And I heard this 20 years ago, back in his, his early playing days, where as good a player as he was, he spent every off season working on something that he thought he could do better. And that's what first, first put this idea in my head a long time ago, that every year I'm going to try to just pick one thing to, to really hyper-focus on uh, to try to do better. I see what you did there. Focus. <laughs> that also answers a question we had from the field. Rachna wanted to know, yeah. why do you think it's going to take a year? Well, it doesn't necessarily take a year, but that's the goal is to just spend a year constantly hitting on the same thing so that I'm really driving it in my subconscious and um, creating something that becomes second nature for me. Right. And, it, and you just use the, the concept of a year as the boundary for you to say, all right, I'm going to pick a thing like Jeter picks the off season to level up something or some things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, a year is kind of an arbitrary time frame. you know, one trip around the sun. It's, um, but why not? Got to pick something. Oscillations of quartz and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. That's what watches, you know, like it's the oscillation of a quartz timed watch. I forget it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on board. I got it. So, <laughs> so let, let me see if there's any other questions that we have from other people. Uh, yeah. Gabe, Gabe affirmed go Red Sox. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't see anything else except a lot of gratitude there. So, oh, all right. I'm glad there's gratitude. Thanks. Yeah. So, I just do a challenge now. How's that? Let's do um, it. And this was in the bottom of the blog post. It's the last thing in the post. And I want to invite anybody who's watching this live or uh, later on to, to do this is to find a way, whether it's one of these ideas or something that you come up with on your own to, to work on and um, to work on this year uh, to stretch yourself create creatively and to try to reach some kind of new plateau and if you want to commit to this, then drop me a line. Uh, uh, just use the contact form at nationalparksatnight.com and uh, drop, drop me a line. I'll, I'll get it and, and tell me what your idea is. At the end of the year, I'll circle back to you and we can talk about how it went. And I'm going to write another blog post next January reporting on all the people who want to commit to this. Awesome. Yeah. So let me, let me see what you're doing. And yeah, remember nationalparksatnight.com, just contact us, or you can do adventure at nationalparksatnight.com. Yep. If you want to skip the website, but we want you to go to the website because you can sign up to get blog posts in your email there. That's a good way to stay in touch with us and read all the wonderful things we write. Um, and what another thing you can do is hit the subscribe button and the little dinghy bell next to it. So you get notifications when we go live and stuff like that. One thing I wanted to add because Tim was pushing it through uh, Tim says that a great way to grow during this current downtime at home would be to ensure that you have, you're taking at least one photo a day. I agree with that. And don't be judgy about the camera. It could be at your phone, regular camera. It doesn't matter. Pinhole camera that you made out of paper towel, paper towel roll tube. Words, they matter right <laughs> i made that last part up tim didn't write that so yeah don't be judgy about the camera just take a picture a day one picture a day that's like the uh who who was the national geographic photographer who did that project was it uh, jim brandenburg who did I, the uh one photo a day with, for 90 days not good with names oh okay. it's a great project it was a great project one photo a day for 90 days and that's Love it. it cut your stuff off Whoa, they talk about boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> Just no kidding. The pressure. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the point is that there's a lot of ways you can do this. There's a yeah. lot of ways to put yourself in a box to force creativity. And there's a lot of ways to release yourself from a box to increase creativity. And they can both work. Uh, yeah. It might be just what are you not used to? It might be what works better for you. Um, but the point is find something to force a creative breakthrough. Yes. Yes, I, 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 one thing that I'd like to just put on top of this is a little icing is when, when you see something and you define it as a boundary, it's an, an opportunity to actually say that this boundary defines an inside space. 
right? Instead of saying, I'm pissed off because there's a boundary that I can't get beyond, just bounce off of that and work inside the space, embrace it and say, okay, I don't have to worry about everything that's outside that boundary. I'll just use the things that are inside the boundary the best I can. Yeah. Yep. Okay. On that note, Chris, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. You too. <laughs> I, I love reading your blog posts and I love it when you make my blog posts read better. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. I love it. I love my job. Oh, we love having you, man. So, uh, Thank you to everybody who dropped by. We had a really, really active live chat tonight. You're all amazing. And we will see you next time. We hope you have a wonderful weekend uh, from all of us here. Have a great day. I'm going to flip to a picture and then that'll lead us out and have a wonderful night. Take care now.